Well, good morning. How's it, how's it going? <laughs> How you guys doing? <laughs> you feeling good today? Today looks like a beautiful day. Have you, have you seen the weather? It looks just perfect. It's one of those perfect summer slash fall right there on the edge. And I think it's beautiful. My wife said to me, she goes, honey, quick, there's a problem. I come running out, what, what, what's going on, what's going on? She goes, look at the trees, they're changing color. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, um, that's, uh, that's normal. Um, seasons change, um, and our experiences in God change and develop, and um, we, wanna, we wanna be moving and growing and uh, learning all that God has to give us Um, But we need to respond uh, to the seasons and the seasons we're in. Um, The Bible tells us that there's a group of men who existed in the times of the Old Testament and uh, they were called the sons of Issachar. And what was unique about these guys was they were always paying attention to the times and the seasons. You know, they, they, were, they were astute spiritually. Remember when Jesus kept saying things like, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? That's because we know that the Spirit is talking. The Spirit is talking. And when the Spirit is talking, God's people need to be listening. Uh, we need to be tuned in to the season when God is speaking. And he's speaking, he is speaking all around the world, but you know, he speaks to his people. He speaks to his, his church. And there are, as the seasons that come and change, God wants us to be in the season that he's in and how he's ministering, how he's dealing. God is probably the best dealer that man has ever known. What do I mean by that? means God knows how to get down into our business and deal with us. And I mean in a good way, but also in a uh, teaching way. Jesus spent three and a half years teaching his disciples. And, you know, sometimes you can see that uh, the Lord was considerably patient with the slow growth of the original 12, um, but there were times that he, he challenged them, even though he, I, I think he was amazingly patient, but three and a half intensive years of, of dealing with them and speaking into their lives and leading them into the season by example. He often set the example and then challenged them whether they were able to come up to that level move into that season with him. And if they, if they did not, he would, he would challenge them and speak to them. And I think that that's kind of a, a universal message to God's church all around the world. It doesn't matter where you live or you know, what time you're living in. When God is speaking to his church, he's speaking to your heart whether you're living in a penthouse in New York City or whether you're living in the uh, jungles of Africa. It doesn't matter. If you know the Lord and God is in a season, he's going to minister that season and see if he can bring you to where he is. Come up here, he said in Revelation chapter 4. Come up higher and I will show you things that shall soon take place. We need to be those kind of people that catch what's going on in the season of God. Uh, One last thing I'll say before I start the message. (laughs) And that is, Jesus, he challenged the believers of his day and the unbelievers, and he said, discern the face of the sky, that you seem to be able to do. You know, he said, but you are not recognizing the day of visitation. Uh, you know, he, 
he was making that case that there are times that we see things, but we don't correlate them correctly. In the same way, he said, I'm going to give you a parable of the fig tree. And he said, when you see that the branches on a fig tree are producing leaves, you know that summer is near. Right? That's, that's, a, that's a seasonal observation. He said, likewise, when you see these particular things that he was referring to in that context, he said, know also that I am near, even at the doors. So that's an observational, seasonal understanding. We need to know when God is at the door. We need to know when Jesus is standing at the door. We need to know when Jesus is walking through a particular time or a season. We, know, we need to have the sensing when God is moving, when God is working, and when God is speaking. We need to have that sensitivity. We don't want to be those who can just tell when it's going to be a good day. My wife and I were watching a beautiful sunset the other day. It was so beautiful, so breathtaking. She, she was snapping pictures while we were driving, and just, just she was amazed. And look at that, look at that. We can see the thing, and we can say, wow, it's going to be. She goes, what does this mean? I go, it's going to be beautiful tomorrow. <laughs> you know, that's what it means. If we can do that in the natural, why can't we do that in the spirit? Well, Jesus said we can and so I'm going to ask you as believers to tune in now. Tune in to what the Spirit is saying to us today. Not just in this message, but in this season. What is God saying to you? A lot of you, I know, you have the word of the Lord heavy on your heart because you know that this church, Hillcrest, is going through some things. And God is speaking to your heart. I would encourage you, uh, follow the voice of His Spirit. Do what he tells you to do. Walk in the way that you need to walk. All right, now last week, beginning this message, last week we taught on loving God, does it really matter? And we told you, yes, it does. It does actually matter. It's a command, it's a condition, and it's a calling. We talked to you about he had given us two commandments. Let's bring up, let's bring up that text of those two commandments. Mark chapter 12, it says this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Notice those four parts. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and there is no other commandment greater than these. So he told us the heart we must love God with all our heart. That is the inner being, the person whom we are, the spirit of, our, of a person, the spirit of a man, and our true self. We, we must truly love him in our hearts. And you can't do that without expression. You can't love your wife or your husband in your heart but not be able to express it or not, not actually show an expression. If your wife or your husband detected that you didn't show any expression of your love for him or her, you, they would obviously be like, you don't love me anymore? After a while, you would start to wonder if there's any, you know, why there's no display of affection, why there's no attention, why there's no, you know, showing of love. So when we love God in the heart, it's got to get expressed. It cannot just be a silent thing. It's got to go out in the open. We told you about loving him with our soul. We told you that refers to your affections, your emotions, your feelings, and your passions. Someone might say, oh, you know, I'm not an emotional person, brother. I'm a logical person. I'm a thinking person. Well, he's got you covered on the mind issue, too. Because you better love him with all that, too. But you were not void or devoid of, a, of feelings, affections, and emotions. You can use them. You must use them because that is the incorporation of your soul. It's what you got. You know, oftentimes we tell people that animals, now please don't get offended. I'm just going to give you something straight 
And it's not necessarily about this message, obviously. But I'm just going to say, we say animals have no spirit, but they do have soul. Okay? Now, in other words, God breathed into human beings the breath of life, and they have spirit. Right? Made in the image of God. God is spirit. But animals, we say, have souls. What is a soul? A soul is that feeling and that expression of affection. And they do. That's why animals can be, uh, can be wounded, and I don't mean physically, but they can be wounded in, in, the, in, their, in their soul. They can be heartbroken. They can be loved. They can be cherished. They can be cared for, and they love to care, and they love to cherish, and they love to save and rescue. And they have wonderful ways of making that known because their soul is expressing through their body, you know? When I wake up every morning, Rocky, my cat, <laughs> you know, comes right over to love me. I'm trying to get my coffee and he's running all around my leg and rubbing up against me and saying, you know, <laughs> you know, he's, that's his good morning. Where's my food? <laughs> they have a way of expressing. You have a soul. You know when you express your soul? When you're singing. And I'm talking about in your car to Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> Whatever you're listening to. Maybe you're listening to country music. Maybe you're listening to gospel. Whatever you're listening to. We express in our music, our soul. We, we, we get into it. Come on. When we celebrate in our weddings, we're, we're, we're dancing. Yeah. That's soul. And when you can't dance, you always got someone looking at you going, he ain't got no soul. <laughs> he got no rhythm. He's got no beat. Those things are all part of the soul. And you can love the Lord your God with your soul. God said it. Jesus said it. Then he said your mind, your thought life. We talked to you about that. How, how you reason. Your conclusions. Listen. Your philosophies. You say, oh, I try to stay away from the philosophies of men. Really? You have your own philosophies. You live by them. One of the things the Word of God tries to get us to do is get our philosophies to line up with His Word. And that kind of gives you right thinking. Otherwise, you'll just go off on the tangent of vain philosophy, the Apostle Paul called it. But the Bible says God wants us to take our mind and worship him in our thought life, in our reasonings, in our choices, and in our acts of the will. So that's how you're loving God in your mind. And then you love God in your strength, your body. It's, it's important to, to, to be able to express, whether it be the clapping of the hands or the raising of the arms, or moving from position to position or whatever you would do. And some people dance and express a, a, a form of joy through their body. They give their efforts. Oh, I just don't feel like going to church today. Well, there's an effort sometimes physically. Maybe you do want to just stay in bed. Maybe you do just want to, you know, go somewhere else or check out the park or do, what, do whatever you're going to do. And all those things have their place but when you know that the Lord wants us to worship him with our strength he's saying with your body too there are times you put in the effort I know many people who said you know you know I didn't come you know I haven't been coming to church lately you know for whatever reasons and I'm like okay okay and then then like you know but I came today and I almost didn't and I am so grateful I came they got what they needed when they came here. Something happened. God spoke to them. You say, yeah, but you don't understand. I got a life, and I got a lot of things I got to do, and I got family, I got children, I got grandchildren, I got, and, and, and I got all those things too. But part of worshiping God with your body is, is, is putting yourself in motion, loving him in motion, and obediences, pursuits, all those things we covered. So we told you that we must love God in our walk, in our worship, and in our warfare. 
Because those are three major avenues that are before every believer. Our walk, our worship, and our warfare. Today's message is entitled, The Message of Love, or The Life of Love. They both work. The Message or The Life of Love. Now, let's get into it. Let's start off with our walk. Let's look more at how that love is walked out in the real world. Now, we talked to you, of course, a lot about loving one another and loving the stranger and loving um, our brother, which can be, or sister, which can be the most difficult, and that's why Jesus put it there. Um, but let's take a look at this from Luke's perspective that he wrote down. Starting in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, we're going to start there. It says this, But I say to you who hear, Say, I hear. Now, let's try it with everybody actually responding. Say, say I hear. Yeah, oh, that's good to know you hear. <laughs> this is Jesus talking. Love your enemies. This is, this is part two, right? This is, this, is, this is doing the I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I love my neighbor as myself. Jesus brings some clarity, and he says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hates you. Now, if you can't find anybody who hates you, give me a few minutes in your life and I'll find somebody. <laughs> you don't have to look far. There are people who hate us for whatever reasons. But do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer all, also the other. And from one who takes away your cloak or your shirt, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, King James would say, who asks of you, and sometimes those Greek words are very close and very similar. Um, this is probably a very accurate translation, so... Have you ever had anybody beg? Have you ever driven by anybody who's begging? Give to everyone who begs from you. I'll hold that. <laughs> and from one who takes away your goods, that would be theft, by the way. From one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. Every one of these statements are action words. And they matter. Because this is how we walk. This is our walk. It's our actual life-to-life, -life, day day-to-day experiences with people. People we know, people we don't know. And every encounter matters. Some people say, I don't even know if I'm walking with God. You're walking every day. Are you walking with God? Because it's expressed with how you are with people. Are you loving God in your walk? This is the message of love. And Jesus tells us that love confronts all these things. But it doesn't do it in a way that that is contrary to the nature of God, but incorporated with the nature of God. God is love. He's not retaliation. He's not revenge. He's, he's not evil and manipulative. We'll look at Corinthians 13 in a few moments when we talk about what love is, the only real definition of love found in any literature is in the Bible. The only definition. The real definition. But Jesus said that our walking in love is demonstrated in how we actually treat people. So you have an opportunity every day in how you walk and how you show your love and your obedience to the second commandment that is the greatest. The first is love God. The second is love people. Let's take a look at this. Luke 6, 32 through 36. 
For if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? You know, if I, if, if I were actually reading this, which I am, I'd say it sounds like the Lord is overseeing all these transactions. You know, you ever go to a bank and you, you see people in line and going up to the tellers and stuff like that, and sometimes you can actually find some bank manager over in the corner going, and he's watching or she's watching what is happening in the transactions, the dispositions of the tellers, how the customers are being treated. All that is valuable. I feel like God does that with his own church. God is watching every transaction. Not, 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 not as a hound, but as one who is watching over his word working in us. I, I, I can handle that. I don't like it. <laughs> I'll be honest, but I can handle it. He's watching. He's, he's watching our transactions with each other and with a stranger. I was with one of my kids. I won't tell you the, which one in this case. I was with one of my kids, and we, we drove by a beggar. And, you know, I got a red light. I got people in line, I got people behind me, you know, and the light is, you know, getting ready to turn green. I'm, I'm trying to find some money. I don't usually carry too much cash, so I'm trying to find some money and I'm digging around and, I'm, and she's like, what are you doing? What are you? <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and I said, oh, I said, I said, you know, I never, I, you know, I, I would get it out in time. You know, hey buddy, here's you know, a, few, a few dollars or here's a 10 or something like that. And, and I said, you know, there was a time I used to drive by them going, you know, I don't, I don't wanna give you money. You're probably gonna abuse it and use it wrongly. And not that I would explain that, I'd just drive by going, I don't see you, I don't see you, I don't see you. But the more I began to see the word, the more I started to realize I'm probably driving by Jesus. Jesus said, when you do these things to the least of them, you do it unto me. When you don't do these things to the least of them, you are not doing it unto me. You are not doing it to me. And one day that hit. And so my child says, oh, what are you, you doing that? I go, well, I didn't want to miss Jesus. <laughs> He's right there. And he needs something. I'm going to help. All right. If you only love those who love you, what benefit is that? What credit is that? If you, even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount although they'll charge interest. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. Yeah, that sounds like the boss is watching because only he knows about our rewards, right? He said, behold, I'm coming and my reward is with me. So he, he definitely is the bank owner, okay? So he's watching all our transactions with people, how we treat them in all the circumstances. You know, thank God I'm always successful in that. <laughs> no, I'm not always successful. But I learn. Your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and even the evil. Be merciful, therefore, even as your father is merciful. This is all walking, walking in the love, walking in the love that we're expressing both to God and through God to people. 
It's real time. It's real. It's the real deal. Now, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 13 because I think it's important to have it in its context. So look, 1 Corinthians 13, and it says this, if I, the Apostle Paul is talking, he says, if I speak in Jabberwocky, <laughs> no, only kidding. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, man, I am just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just making noise. And if I have prophetic powers, whoa, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, which is demonstrated in the most unwelcomed experiences, I am nothing. I'm nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, now this is a challenging statement, because he's talking about people who literally empty themselves of possessions and, and things, even allow themselves to be sacrificed but don't do it with a heart of love, but have motives that can only be exposed by God for why they do such a thing. If any of you took up my challenge to read Acts chapter four and Acts chapter five to kind of give you the understanding of the church and the mindset of giving, especially giving in the time of great need, in those particular passages, the churches were going through terrible need. Star there was even starvation in the cities um, because a famine had come through. There was all kinds of issues happening. The heavy taxation of the Romans and the church was really struggling and the apostles came together and said, we need money, we need a collection. And they got the word out to the church and the church began to do all kinds of things like selling their, their possessions or selling their homes or selling uh, you know, whatever they had, and it says they came and laid the money at the apostles' feet and said, distribute it how you need to distribute it. Get her done. And then somebody came in, in Acts chapter five, this is, I'm talking about how motives got exposed. Somebody came in and said, hey, here's, uh, Here's, I told you, you know, when I sold the house, I was gonna sell my house and, and get, get the money. I got the money, this is what I got for it, and I'm giving the whole thing, the whole shebang to the apostles for you guys to distribute. And the Spirit of God came upon Peter and he said, he said, really? He said, uh, this is what you sold it for? Yeah. Exactly. And he said, uh, he said, Ananias, he said, why has your heart been filled with lies? Why have you let Satan get into your heart? And Ananias dropped dead. <laughs> Someone says, well, my gosh, the man comes and brings money, probably a large sum, gives it, and he still gets disciplined or strick, stricken by God? Well, I didn't write it. I'm just telling you this is what happened in the book of Acts. It wasn't because he gave. It was because he lied and had proposed publicly to give what he got for the sale. I got an extra house, me and Sapphira, you know, we saved up back in the day. We got an extra house. We sold it. Um, and I'm going to give all my proceeds to this cause, Peter, James, John, and all the rest of the church that's listening. I'm going to do that. I'm going to get that in there. You, I'm going to meet that need. And when it came time to sell the house, he didn't do that. He got 
whatever he got for the house, and then he took a small portion. Clearly not the portion of the whole thing that it should have been that he said. And he did it going, and Peter asked him, going, is this everything? This is, the, this is what you said? You got this for the house? He goes, yeah, that's all I got. Then his wife comes in, not knowing what had just transpired. And she says, hey, <laughs> how's the collections going? Is, you know, was my hubby here? How'd that work out? And he goes, hey, everything's f- cool. But just, I just got a quick question. Uh, you, when you guys sold the house, you know, and you, you got a, you, is this the amount that you got for that house? Yeah, that's, the, that's it. Oh, he told you? Yeah, 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 that's what we got. And he's like, are you kidding me? Now all the church people were watching this. And God exposed the motives that was behind this person. You, know, you, you all bragged. Lady, you bragged with your husband of what, that you were going to give all the proceeds. Now, you didn't have to. And he goes and explains. He goes, he goes, when you got all those proceeds, wasn't it yours to do with as you wanted? And she's like, well, yeah. And he goes, then why did you go and brag that you're going to do this and actually not do what you said? And you, you, have, a, you have a secrecy in your heart. You're deceptive and you're a liar. And the people who carried out your husband are now going to carry you out. And she dropped dead right in church. It wasn't because they gave, it's because they lied. And they said they were going to give this amount. They said, I'm going to give this. This is what God put on me to do. I told you, and I made it known. And God exposed their motives. That greed got in, and they said, Oh, I ain't giving that. So, God w- deals with the motives when we are practicing the love. If I give away all I have, but have wrong motives, <laughs> and if I deliver up my body to be burned, if you can bring that verse back up, Dan, Corinthians 13. But I don't have love. In other words, there was no, there's no love in that. The motive was false. I gain nothing. Do you remember that passage of Scripture when Jesus said they already have their reward? If you receive the praise or the accolades of men... You've already got your reward. He said, but in your giving, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In your service to God, don't go brag when you go and help somebody out and let everybody know. When you're walking out in love, it's the one, it's the boss who's watching. And he's the only one who matters when we're walking out love. Now, is this too tough? (laughs) <laughs> well, Paul doesn't think so. <laughs> is this too strong of a message? Are you, are you able to handle this? You're not getting mad at me now going, going oh, I don't like how he talks sometimes. I just don't like it. <laughs> I'm not talking a tenth of how hard the Lord Jesus spoke, even to his own disciples. Because he, he challenged them. And if you want to go to a church where there's no challenge, you're welcome to do that. But I, I grew up in a church where I was challenged. And that's made me pretty much what I am today. You got to be able to handle it. I don't say these things. Here's the cool part. I don't say these things because I need something to say or... I say these things because I love. I love you. And the Lord did the same thing. So let's continue on with Corinthians 13. Love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And in the King James, it says, love never fails. 
You say, well, why are you telling me the rest of that verse? This rest of the verse is the way we deal with one another and the way we deal with those outside. And I don't have to go through that three times for us to figure out if we're following that. We can just look at that and realize whether we are or not. Because it's challenging. But you can't do it on your own anyway. That's the beauty. When you're loving God as your first commandment, the second one is empowered by the first. You see, you can't do this on your own. You can only do it with God doing it through you. He empowers you in those circumstances. And when we walk away unwilling to relent and show these things like patience with somebody who's always pooping on your parade or being hard to you or being disrespectful to you and showing patience. This is, this, this is, this is called probably the greatest chapter in the Bible. People have referred to it often like that. But I can honestly tell you I hated this verse almost my entire Christian life. <laughs> it was only when I grew up a little bit and said, if this ain't happening in me, what am I doing saying I'm worshiping the God of love? If I'm not loving people, if I'm willing to tear their head off at, at the slightest slight, and you sing, oh, you, you seem like such a kind person, Pastor. I can't even imagine you like that. Yeah, well, you didn't know me years ago. I was not always a nice person. And, you know, I was a fighter, and I was, you know, vengeful. I remember plotting with a friend of mine whose tires I was going to slash because they, you know, had done some slight to me or what we were going to do to make their life uncomfortable, you know. We settled on lowering the air pressure out of the tires. <laughs> I decided not to flatten, you know, slice them. <laughs> I decided to, I'll just let the air out. You're like, I can't believe it. Well, that was 30 years ago, maybe more. But you, you get what I'm saying? Practicing these things doesn't mean it's easy. But we're given the opportunity all the time to walk out love, to walk it out. And we can say, Lord, help me in my inability. Help me to experience the way you would be with people. That's why that whole, what would Jesus do, came out years and years ago constant reminder of how would Jesus handle this I think we don't ask that question enough I think it was a beautiful brilliant question in its day and it, it really always applies what would Jesus do in this you say well I have no idea well then you must not know him well you ought to be able to answer that question what would Jesus do and usually the first thing that comes to your mind when you ask that question is the answer <laughs> you're like you know I always think it's funny when, when some believers come to me and they say pastor is it wrong if I do such and such and such and such and nine times out of ten I'm like I think you already know the answer to that is there something you might be wanting to find out how you can get around that <laughs> Your conscience is speaking to you, which means the Lord is speaking to you because the Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching out the inward parts of the belly or the body. The spirit, God is speaking to you from his spirit to your spirit and guiding you with his light. And you're hearing that and knowing what you should do, but you don't want to do that. And is there a way around my prickly conscience? No, there's no way around it. It's better to submit to it and go with it even if it's hard, and that's the demonstration of love, that's how you walk out love. It's, it's not run out, it's not standing still, it's walking. You gotta experience it. And so that's walking in our, walking out our love. How do you love God in your worship? 
How do you do that in your worship? Romans chapter 12 says this, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. He says, using your body in worship, do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And yes, in small, brief comment, I always tell people and give them this verse whenever they're struggling to find God's will. Where do I go when I'm in trouble? You go to Romans chapter 12. <laughs> Submit unto that, especially verse two. But verse one is often quickly passed and overlooked. Verse one says, if I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. So we love God in our worship with your body in how it behaves and how it functions. Never be ashamed to express bodily your love for God in worship. Whether it be in the sanctuary, I mean, if we need ushers to come and help you clap, we will get them to do that. <laughs> no. But some people can never move their hands. They're like stuck in a paralyzed position. But you know, we have no problem worshiping at a football game. We have no problem shouting I say shout to the Lord, and sometimes I'm the only one who does it. You say, well, you're, you're trying to lead by example. Right, are you gonna follow or what? <laughs> I'm being a little playful, but serious at the same time. Because it's okay to worship God with your, <laughs> clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Praise him. Praise him, shout unto God with the voice of praise. <laughs> with the fruit of my lips, I praise your name. Praise him, praise him. Amen? And so you can love God literally with your body, and guess who's seeing it? The boss at the bank. He's watching. As a matter of fact, he goes further than that. The Bible tells us he inhabits the praise of his people. You say, what does that mean? I have no idea, but it sounds wild, <laughs> to be honest. I'll do a study on it sometime, but I can tell you, it means he lives in it. He loves in it. And praising God when things are not going so well is not always easy, right? I preach it all the time, and I experience the opportunity all the time as well. Meaning, I don't always succeed. Sometimes I'm upset and I'm like, oh, I can't believe this is happening again. I can't believe this is going on. And I, and I feel like I hear the Lord going, praise him, praise him, shout unto God with the voice of praise. And I'm like, no way, no way. <laughs> I'd rather go to bed and die. <laughs> Some people haven't learned how to shout, and sing, and dance, and get happy but that's part of your worship. You say, oh, that sounds like a sacrifice. That's what he called it too, a living sacrifice. You got, you got people all the time who say things like, oh man, I, you know, I'd die for Jesus, I'd die for the Lord. You know, even Peter did that, he pulled that one, right? I'll die for you, Lord. He goes, will you, Peter? Will you die for me? Now he eventually did, but it wasn't long before Peter actually denied that he even knew Jesus. We often boast that we want to die for the Lord and one day be a martyr for the kingdom and we boast, boast with our mouth, say these things that we don't do because we won't even live for the Lord. God doesn't want a dead sacrifice. He wants a living sacrifice. Many people have died for the Lord. Many people say they'll die for the Lord, but can you live for him? Because that's where the challenge is. All right. 
Lastly, my friends, we love God in our warfare. You say, how do you love God in warfare? Well, if you keep letting the enemy tear into your soul and stop you from progression and growth and maturity, if you keep allowing the enemy to run over your family and run over your finances and run over your problems and you don't fight to accomplish all that God has called you to do, and the things that you need to fight for, for the things that God has given you, like your family, like your children, like your grandchildren. You love God in your warfare because you're promoting his kingdom. Ephesians 6 says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil that are in heavenly realms or high places. The enemy plays for keeps, and our challenge is to love God through the most difficult of experiences. Whether we're walking out his love whether we're worshiping his and in, in that love and worshiping him by our, by our expression of love, or whether we are in warfare and fighting for the things that matter. And we stand up and we say, I'm in, and I'm not gonna let the enemy tear into my life. I realize that the enemy is trying to hold me back, hold me down, and cancel me out. And I will not allow that. I will serve God. And I will love Him. And I'll walk it out. I'll worship it out. And I'll warfare it and fight it out. From this day to my last day. And that's a believer. Amen. Let's stand up. It's the message of love. It is not passive. Love, love is not passive. It's always in action. It's demonstrated. For God so loved the world, he gave, he demonstrated his love. While we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us, and gave himself. Hallelujah. We're called to do the same. Let's demonstrate our love. Father, in Jesus' name, oh Lord, work in our heart, work in our soul. I give it to you. I lay myself open for you. And I'm going to do something, Lord, with courage and respect and evidence. 